So this week, Hamza Youssef was voted as the new leader of the SNP and becomes the first minister of Scotland, replacing Nicola Sturgeon. He beat his rival Kate Forbes by um, 52 to 48 after second preference votes, the golden ratio or cursed ratio, uh, depending on your opinion. Tom, he should have done a lot better, really. I mean, I know know he won, obviously, Mm -hmm. but considering that this is a man who had the fulsome backing of the SNP establishment and his rival Kate Forbes was utterly demonised. Mm-hmm. Shouldn't he really have walked it a lot more? Well, that in that sense, it's very interesting because the, the result on paper doesn't looks like exactly what everyone would thought. He was the continuity candidate. Yeah. He was essentially Sturgeon's handpicked successor. She didn't quite say that, but it was made very clear by the actions of her allies in the mm-hmm. last few days of the campaign. You saw John Swinney, her um, depart, uh, outgoing sort of deputy, throw his lot in with Humza, which upset many people in the Kate Forbes camp. Um, you also it was it, it was no it was the there was worst kept secret in Edinburgh that, it, yeah. that Humza Yusuf was obviously that that guy. Um but it, again this is something that's been striking throughout the campaign is that to an extent whilst Nicola Sturgeon maintained a very tight grip on her particular party, Sturgeonism such as it is, is mm. is not. Um and in her absence it seems like he's finding it incredibly difficult to kind of pick up that mantle so much so that, as you say, even in a SNP leadership race with a party membership that we were told was so incredibly socially liberal, by which they kind of mean woke and intolerant, <laughs> yeah. they couldn't possibly um, countenance someone like Kate Forbes, a socially yeah. conservative Christian, being anywhere near Butte House, that it became incredibly close, that they seemingly largely rejected that demonization that that pretty concerted campaign suggested that she was an illegitimate candidate to, mm. to lead this particular party um completely failed so whilst um the result wasn't that surprising i think it it showed us that um these ideas um the ideas that have really derailed the kind of smp campaign this weddedness to this woke intolerance um the the general kind of failures of the kind of tight clique yeah. around sturgeon the, even the, even the SNP sort of selectorate are seemingly starting to tire and break away from that. So very interesting on that from definitely. And and I, what do you make of Hamza? You excited for his uh, leadership? Well, I mean, as someone who broadly thinks that we, you know, the union is a good thing, I think he's a great um, asset to the, <laughs> the unionist cause. I mean, he's really got nothing. You know, just nothing. He, he said his, his, the first thing he's going to do, his principal mission, is to enact this uh, gender self-ID law, which is the very thing that brought down you know, his predecessor. Not not dealing with you know, the, the drug deaths in Scotland, the crisis in education, the cost of living issues that all of us are facing, you know, issues around energy and and, and security and so on, Actually, very big challenges. Um, I would say that you know Scotland has it, including the rest of the United Kingdom. His, his principal issue is is this gender self ID, and I just think um, I just think it's really embarrassing. I mean, there is some hope. You know, it's great to see that actually. I mean, even though she had her her flaws, it's it's good to see that forty eight percent of um, S and B voters were willing to. Uh, change tack and, and and do something different, but it just tells you that how little wind is really left in this um, kind of SNP Scottish independence cause. It's not based off of you know, a radical um, transformative vision that um, you know, democratic and and sovereign. Mm. Um, it, it's it's really oh, just this kind of very boring, predictable. Uh, tried and tested and failed kind of progressive so-called progressive agenda um that is deeply anti-democratic and doesn't actually address any of the kind of genuine material concerns that that um people have in society and and is based off of so much of a kind of grievance politics Mm. um so i think you know he he wants to take that cause on um I, i wish him good luck (laughs) <laughs> um, but you know, I doubt, I doubt it's going to um, inspire many Scottish voters or, or bring him the the independence that apparently they want. Well, I mean, one thing people, a lot of people have suggested is that um, Hamza is someone who's sort of failed upwards, mm. given his terrible record across pretty much every ministry he's been in, whether it's transport, health, justice. And he's quite a gaff prone 
mm. politician. Um, probably the best gaffe recently was uh, during the campaign was when he spoke to um, a bunch of Ukrainian women and asked them where the men were. Mm. Um, I think, think about that. Think about it. <laughs> think about that for a second. <laughs> yeah, did, did he mean that as a joke? I mean, it was one in a long line. I mean, the scooter is a personal <laughs> favourite. Yeah, oh God. It's when he'd hurt his ankle and he was he was rolling around in this little knee scooter. And then reportedly, from what you hear, uh, he saw the camera up ahead and wanted to show off a bit. <laughs> and falls off the scooter, then gets upset that the BBC tweeted the video. Well, exactly. It's... Made 10 times funnier by him getting angry about it, <laughs> about people sharing it on social media. It is that reminder that he is sort of um, all the dreadful policies of the Sturgeon era with none of the polish. I mean, he's just such a bungler. And it is <laughs> constantly quite amusing. I mean, the other thing, of course, and we spoke about this last time we spoke about him, but that speech he gave in Holyrood where he essentially denounced the fact that the the holders of, of high office across Scotland were all white. He kind of listed yeah. them off. The Lord Advocate, white, every <laughs> police... Um, Chief Inspector White and so on. I mean, Scotland is a very white country, yeah. like much more than England. <laughs> and yet this apparently hadn't really dawned on him. So you do hope that all of these things will stand, uh, again, the, the the health of politics across the, the UK in, in good stead. I think it is nevertheless important to count against complacency, particularly those of us who oppose Scottish secession for all the reasons that Nye was talking about. Um the fact that no one's still really talking about the SNP not being the largest party at the next yeah. election in Scotland. Yeah. Um, it's it's vice-like grip for a long time, which I think has been shown to be a lot weaker than people were given to uh, were given to think. Um, it's nevertheless pretty significant. Um, and that's something which I think there's there can be no, as I say, complacency when it comes to taking this off. A lot over the course of the past six months, a lot of that is rotten about both the SNP machine and the independent project underneath their under their kind of stewardship has been brought out into the open, but the job surely isn't done in terms of pushing that back quite Def firmly. Definitely. The, on terms of the rottenness, it is worth, you know, <laughs> reminding people that the uh, chief executive of the SNP resigned in the middle of this campaign, Pete Morrill, um, who's also Nicholas Surgeon, hus Surgeon's husband, mm -hmm. um, which shows you the kind of um, cliqueishness yeah. of, of the party. He had to resign because he was allegedly giving false um, membership statistics. You know, there's been a huge drop in membership since both the sort of failed Supreme Court challenge and since the obviously infamous Gender Recognition Act. Um, and so it was interesting that lots of people who would have resigned, would have tired of um, Nicola Sturgeon's inability to get independence over the line. Maybe those people have gone to sort of at the Alba party, which is a bit more hard line on this. And those people who um, will have left over the gender recognition bill, still many of them um, not backing um, the obvious candidate for um, who represents that that kind of cause? Um, we should briefly mention the prayer, the famous um, prayer um, selfie that Hamza Yusuf released on the, on his first day in Butte House. I mean, and I've what have you made of the uh, reaction to that? Yeah, I mean, it is. It just reveals that the double standard. You know, I, I mean, Kate Forbes, um, as we know, was seriously you know scrutinised uh, and and criticised very strongly uh, for holding. Uh, the views that she had, her kind of traditional uh, Christian views, the Free Church of Scotland, um, and uh, Hamza Yusuf uh, praying, which you no, know, he he has a right to do, but in an all male all, all male prayer, um, what was lauded and praised um, in this in this wonderful way. But we full, fully know that if Kate Forbes did the same thing, um, that you know people probably would have said all sorts of horrible things. Um, about her and, and what she's doing. And it, it really does show the double standards about how we treat um, some religions that on the kind of hierarchy of, of um, identity mm. and hierarchy of victimhood can claim greater kind of moral um, and cultural superiority um, over others. And, and the, the double standard really highlighted that. And it's also worth stressing as well, and Brendan made this point in his piece about this this week, which is that this hierarchy is also amongst ethnic minority groups and minority yeah. religions as well. So Rishi Sunak being a practicing Hindu, even having little Ganesha on his on his desk at work and so on, uh, you didn't see this. There was a there was a kind of bit of residual sort of gushing over representation and so yeah. on. It didn't last very long, but certainly from the left, the response you got was that he's a water carrier for. Again, Hindu dog, nationalism, Hindu or nationalism linked up with white supremacy. These are the kinds yeah. of arguments you see on that particular part of politics. Yeah. So th this kind of hierarchy of what identities are 
um, deemed to be celebratory and so on is very much there. And also, if we're being honest, a lot of this just cuts down politically. Like if a particular ethnic minority has the wrong kind of politics, yeah. then they can quickly be cast out of the, um, again, the community of the good very mm. quickly. Yeah, it, it just shows just how tedious and tiresome the politics of identity are. I mean, it, Hamza Youssef, his position as the, the leader of, of Scotland is an incredibly consequential position for um, you know, everyday Scottish people in terms of what kinds of things, what vision does he have for Scottish society? How did, what, what's his track record and how is he going to implement and, and, and make Scotland a more freer and prosperous society? You know, those really important questions about his politics and his and his actual ability are completely sidelined and, and kiboshed in favour of um, very shallow celebrations about uh, his skin colour or you know, his how he expresses his religion. Like, what, what are the the real questions that hold him to account, keep him on his toes, and make sure that he actually does a good job? But identity politics washes over all of those things. And um, if you sing the right notes and, and wear the right things, then that's all. That's all that, that matters.